Welcome to Finding Certainty with your host and U.S. Army veteran, Patrick Lang. Over the next hour, you'll learn from Patrick and his expert guests how to attract more certainty into your business and your life. Now, here is your host, Patrick Lang. Welcome to Finding Certainty, everyone. Uh, This is Patrick, and I'm very pleased to have special guest today, Ms. Natasha Lance Rogoff. She's an award-winning uh, television producer, filmmaker, and journalist. And today, we're going to, among other things, we're going to be talking about her experience taking the Muppets to Russia. And uh, she wrote a book about it, uh, Muppets in Moscow, The Unexpected Crazy True Story of Making Sesame Street in Russia. So, Natasha, thanks for being here today. Really looking forward to hearing your story and helping our listeners get to know you a little bit. Thank you. It's great to be here. Nice to meet you too, Patrick. My pleasure. Um, We're both uh, broadcasting from a hotel room today. You're in New York and I'm in Dallas for a conference. So uh, appreciate you uh, fitness in even while you're on the road. My pleasure. So I always start out our show explaining a couple of reasons why I've invited this specific guest. And you have a long list of accolades. I mean, you've you've even won a, a a telly award for your documentary, The Hollywood's Architect, the Paul R. Williams story, to my understanding. Uh, That's a big deal. Um, Natasha is an associate at Harvard in their art, film, and visual studies department. And um, you've been all over the world. But the, the, the two main reasons I invited Natasha to be on Finding Certainty today is your story really embodies what we stand for here at Finding Certainty. First and foremost, it's about overcoming challenges, being able to uh, think outside the box and consider new relationships and new approaches and so forth in order to find success. If we want to find certainty, we most certainly have to do that. The second, though, is that one of our pillars is that we have to work together. We have to look past our differences. We have to link arms. If we want to accomplish more, if we focus on what we, uh, how we differ, uh, we usually are not going to be able to accomplish nearly as much. But if we focus on what we have in common and our similarities, amazing things can happen. So, so why don't we just start out by having you tell us a little bit about your, your, your background? What led to you actually taking the Muppets in to Russia? Well, it was a, a a journey that was completely unexpected. As I was a filmmaker for many years, uh, working in what was then the Soviet Union in the 1980s. And I went there when I was 22 years old uh, to study Russian, Russian language at the local university in Leningrad, you know, now St. Petersburg. Right. Um, and, you know, was thoroughly fascinated by other cultures and especially by, you know, dictatorships and, you know, had read so much about World War II uh, because my family had had left Europe, um, you know, in the in the early part of the century. And we still had family there as well. So, you know, the idea of uh, that part of the country, Belarusia, Russia, Ukraine, now being, you know, under the uh, umbrella of communism just just fascinated me, you know, from the time I was a teenager. And and then I, you know, decided to study Russian and I went to uh, University of California at Berkeley. And there was a great program where we had a cultural exchange for uh, Americans from many different universities. There were 30 Americans in Moscow and 30 in what was then Leningrad. Um, and we were able to study at um, the university. So that's that's how I first came to Russia. And of course, once there, uh, you know, fell in love with the the people, the culture. Um, it was so so engrossing, so different, and from my own country that I just wanted to write about it and make films about it which is what I did for the next 10 years until the Soviet Union uh, collapsed. And at that point, uh, I had made a film which had predicted the coup that overthrew uh, the Soviet empire. 
and two Sesame Street executives came to that screening in New York City at um, my then uh, you know, graduate school uh, where, I, where I went to school for Soviet foreign policy, nuclear strategy, which is what I was studying um, while not making films. And uh, they showed up and said, hey, uh, watch the film. And then they said, would you like to help us bring the Muppets to Moscow? Because then Senator Biden had spearheaded congressional approval for a Russian version, an original version of Sesame Street to be made in uh, Moscow with Russians, Ukrainians, you know, everybody would be part of it. And with the support of the uh, Russian um, Ministry of oh, my, my uh, Ministry of uh, Education. So, uh, you know, I looked at them and I said, did you just watch this film that I, that, that you know, you just <laughs> sat through and where I was embedded with, uh, uh, you know, hardline conservatives who, you know, were uh, working every angle they could to keep the Soviet Union from imploding. I was like, yeah, you know, it's like a very serious film. And, and I was like, the Muppets? I, I don't see the connection, you know. But anyway, they were they were amazing. They said, well, look, you know, we've been trying to do this for uh, a while. We have very, a strong interest from the Congress and maybe you can help. So yeah, I went right. down to their their uh, headquarters, and it was you know there was Big Bird painted on the wall, and there are all these really earnest young people. You know, by this time I was thirty two, and the energy was incredible. So as I learned about what you know Sesame Workshop does, then the Children's Television Workshop, which is a nonprofit, does around the world, I thought, wow, this this could have such a tremendous impact on, you know, the millions of children living across 11 time zones. So I think I was, I was pretty hooked from the beginning. And, and then when they explained that the, uh, the Muppets would be, uh, you know, the best ambassadors for idealistic values, you know, to model ideas of uh, freedom of expression, tolerance, inclusivity, so this this was completely different from anything I had ever done in my life, but very exciting. Well, I think it's fascinating. I think some people looking at the title and wondering what is the what do the Muppets have to do with a business channel and and yet it's about overcoming odds. It's about creating these relationships and these um, these connections between very different cultures and you know two completely different countries and. And yet you talk about tolerance, you talk about the Muppets being ambassadors for these principles. It's very interesting to me. You know, your, your education is phenomenal. You, you went to Berkeley, you attended in Leningrad, got your master's at Columbia, is my understanding. And now you're teaching at Harvard. And, and yet this came about without a lot of planning. It isn't something you set out to do or something that you planned to do in your career. It just kind of fell in your lap is that is that fair to say absolutely fair i mean it's not uh i think it's fascinating because many young people ask me today you know uh what's your advice you know your career advice to you know follow your dreams to realize what you know what you hope to do in your life and of course my my path was incredibly random uh i would say the only um say principle that guided it was you know always to follow what i was passionate about and um it seemed to you know generally work out uh but definitely there were times when it was you know lean times and you know especially when you're making documentaries it's very difficult to to make a living and pay your rent right but um you know if it's if it's um I just feel that if you're if you're passionate about something, there's a way to find other people who are passionate about the same thing. And then you can, you know, build a great team and you can make things happen. I couldn't agree more. That seems to be a recurring theme throughout all of my guests. I mean, we've had billionaires on our show. We've had other television producers like Gary Reeves and Two weeks ago, we had the founder and, and uh, dean of the Paul Mitchell Schools 
Um, so we've had a wide variety of guests, but this theme of passion is very much a recurring principle. Um, so what was it like? I mean, I know when you decided to take on this project and they were impressed by what you'd done, it was a, a very much a pivot or a different focus for you. But when you took it into Muppets, it wasn't an easy path, right? It was probably most, one of the most challenging times and, and um, I think assignments that any journalist has ever had. And yet you, you met with some amazing success. So what was it like? I mean, what was the most dif difficult part perhaps of the assignment? I believe the, the hardest part was uh, probably assembling the team and raising the money. So even though we had um, funds appropriated by the US Congress, you know, several million, um, we had to match the funding because uh, the, the Congress demanded and USAID, the agency uh, responsible for um, aid internationally, that the uh, Russians had skin in the game. So we actually had to match the US funding. And in this market, as you said, you know, the, it was a time of incredible instability, uh, transition, very painful for many Soviet citizens as their country was being, uh, you know, torn apart and various uh, parts of what was once a united empire, the Soviet Union, uh, countries were, you know, breaking off and declaring their independence, former republics like Georgia, Ukraine, Armenia. And for many people who had lived their entire life for 70 years under this Soviet system, under communism, you know, these were brothers, even though there was a great deal of, uh, uh, you know, discrimination against a lot of people, uh, uh, particularly of color, living in uh, what was then the Soviet Union. Uh, you know, these, these they were all part of one country. And generally, uh, they spoke Russian. You know, they spoke their own native languages too, but everybody spoke Russian. It was taught, you know, since Stalin's time. Many people were murdered as a result of that, but it did happen. So it was really difficult. It was also difficult getting food at the time and taking care of your loved ones or your elderly parents because there was, uh, you know, the healthcare system was, was collapsing. So it was into this environment that we brought uh, the idea of making a children's TV show with puppets. And we met really difficult uh, challenges. You know, the first, as I mentioned, was raising the money where our uh, first sponsor who we um, uh, got a, a go ahead with, who was gonna commit um, a, a great deal of money to the production. He was a Russian oligarch and he was gaining a lot of um, uh, power of the local TV station, which was Russia's largest TV station that disseminated across 11 time zones. So after meeting with him for uh, a meeting that took uh, months to set up, he agreed after you know we spoke about Big Bird and the other Muppets and how Big Bird wouldn't be in the show because there would be original Slavic style Muppets design that would reflect Russian culture and uh, values and aesthetics. Um, and we were so excited about this happening. And then three weeks after that meeting, his car was blown up in a bombing and he was, uh, you know, we found out quite a bit later, but he was severely burned and um, he obviously was no longer, you know, paying much attention to making this puppet show because he had way bigger problems. Um, so we dealt with enormous amounts of violence, which I write about in the book. I mean, you don't really think of, you know, making a children's television show in Russia and, you know, bombings, assassinations, uh, but this is what happened. And our office was taken over by soldiers with AK-47s. So, you know, when I wrote this, I just thought it was such a remarkable story that really needed to be shared now. Um, and aside from the violence, the other aspect that we had to deal with were what you alluded to before, cultural clashes. So what is it like when you are trying to make a new TV show 
And, you know, the people who are the creative team that is making the show are, they are coming from different backgrounds. And the team that we're working with is coming from 70 years of communism and ideology, communist ideology, a socialist system. And we are coming from Sesame Street's progressive, uh, you know, way of seeing the world as well as a, uh, a democracy with rule of law, a constitution. These elements were not present in the, the post-Soviet society at that time. So how did we find chimenality, you know, to make puppets, to design a new set, a new neighborhood that reflected what was going to be new Russian values? Not just Russian. When I say Russian, I mean post-Soviet for the entire uh, former Soviet Union, because the show, as I mentioned, was distributed ultimately to Ukraine, Armenia, Georgia, and throughout the former Soviet Union. For, yes. Well, it's it's interesting because I think as Americans, you know, many of us have a limited understanding. We think of America as the only melting pot, right? But Russia has all these different cultures, different nationalities many of whom are from Russia itself. Others have, have immigrated there. Others have intermarried. You know, there's these all these different republics and a lot of culture there, a lot of layers of culture. And so we're coming up on our, our, our first break here, but I think it's uh, this story itself, it, it has so many different layers and different aspects to it that um, I think at first people think, well, Muppets in, in Moscow, taking the Sesame Street to Russia. That seems like that would be pretty easy, <laughs> but it's, it wasn't. And when we come back, I want to get into a little bit more of uh, what uh, the challenges that you, you met, how you overcame them. Uh, as a big part of what our show is, is about how we overcome the challenges, because whether you're in business, you're in television producing, and you're in, you're, you're in a marriage, you know, there are principles that apply. Uh, you even had a baby and uh, I saw a picture of you holding your baby while you're working on your, your, your project, you, this newborn. And that adds a whole, a, a whole nother element or layer to what you did. Uh, so this, this is very, this is very interesting to me. I think uh, um, I'm even I, I've, I've read into it and I've done a little bit of research on your story, but the layers that you, that you, the, the challenges you overcame and the layers that make up this story are just absolutely extraordinary. So, uh, we're visiting well, with. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> well, it's it's amazing to me. It, you know, we're we're visiting with not Natasha Lance Rogoff. Uh, she is the best-selling author of Muppets in Moscow, and uh, we're going to go to our first break. But when we get right when we get back, we will uh, continue the conversation. So don't go away. All clear, fantastic segment back in two. Thank you, Andrew. So we are Thank shooting you. a YouTube video at the same time, so we're still recording. Um, no, but... I should have put makeup on. Oh, well, <laughs> I didn't know that. Oh, well. Yeah, yeah I, uh, I I feel a lot of sort when I'm in, my, in a hotel room. I don't have my normal mic and my soundboard and my yeah. headphones are making a weird background noise. So it is what it is. It's life, right? Challenges. Yeah. So you were pretty familiar with Russia. You'd lived there for many years. You were fluent in Russian. And um, and yet, where were you based? Were you you served in the military, right? I did. I was where in, were you based? I was in Texas. I was in Italy. Uh, my unit went to Desert Storm in Iraq. We had um, uh, as far as training, I was in Texas, Washington, New Jersey. I worked in. What, what were you doing? What was your specialty? I worked in counterintelligence, and I was an interpreter. I speak fluent Italian, so I, I interpreted in Italian and worked in Central Italy and Central Europe, and then, um, but primarily worked in counterintelligence. Interesting. I'm going to Rome in June for for oh, about okay. six days. I'm so excited. You've been there before? Only once when my son was uh, about one and a half. And that's it. I haven't been there since. So I'm so, it's just so excited. I'm so excited to go see, you know, how it's changed. And... It's an amazing city. Our, uh, 
our, our my family, my wife and her parents were just over there last year, and uh, I didn't go. It was kind of a daughter parents trip and 15 seconds all right thanks andrew but it's an amazing country i've been all mm -hmm. over okay we're coming back you are listening to finding certainty with patrick lang have a question for patrick or his guests join us on the show at 866-472-5790. That's 866-472-5790. Now, back to the show with Patrick. Welcome back, everyone. We're visiting with Natasha Lance Rogoff. She's a producer and director, a writer of multiple television documentaries and, and children's programming for over 25 years, uh, best-selling author of Muppets in Moscow. So Natasha, we've been talking a little bit about uh, how this assignment, this project to take the Muppets to Russia uh, came about unexpectedly. You decided it was a uh, it was a good opportunity and so you tackled it. And yet you were met with a lot of obstacles. you and your team. We, we, you talked about assassination attempts and a car bombing of your of your investor and I mean, I read something about getting a call from the people at the at the studio screaming, there's soldiers here with AK 47s. And I mean, this is not normal stuff. The most not not most your possible. not your average children's <laughs> television puppet show. <laughs> and yet you talk you talk about taking the Muppets to Russia. It was much more than just a television show. The, the Muppets, in a very real sense, were a model, and you use the word ambassador, which I love that. But they were a model of a free and open society. They, they were modeling these principles that in many respects were new and, and foreign to the Russian people coming out of the Soviet Union. This is post-USSR, uh, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I find that really fascinating because you wouldn't think of that on a geopolitical <laughs> scale of the Muppets as being the catalyst to making such change come about and and i want to talk a little bit later about the russian ukraine war and how you mm -hmm. feel that movement having you know kids that grew up watching the muppets mm -hmm. how that has affected how they're feeling today because i think there are some very powerful repercussions if you will ripple effects that came out of that but uh, let's talk a little bit more about uh, about the process. When you, you you talked about how you need to put you needed to put together a, a team, and you really had to create all new characters. You weren't just bringing Bert and Ernie over in in Big Bird. You were creating puppets, aka Muppets, that were they were entirely new. They had to have a Russian culture, Russian russian personalities leanings etc so let's talk about that because i think it's a really interesting piece of this this pie it is a, it is fascinating that you know sesame workshop uh which is a nonprofit, you know working around the world doesn't just import sesame street the whole approach is to design the show in collaboration with local producers television professionals artists and to you know create a program that's going to be successful in that country, but also is developed with their own values in, in mind. And that was particularly challenging in Russia, as you know, you can expect that the progressive values of Sesame Street uh, might uh, bump up against 400 years of uh, you know, rather conservative Russian thought. Uh, but at the same time, you know, the country, Soviet Union, was also very progressive in many ways. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, it had both the, the, you know, combination of being a radical socialist country and also, uh, you know, an oppressive country. <laughs> so we were dealing with that legacy in, in trying to develop the, the new puppets and the design for the show and the content the way that happens is in the curriculum seminar, which is the cornerstone of every international Sesame Street production, 
where you bring together the creative team and educators. So these are teachers, professors, you know, children's education experts, and together the group decides what are going to be the goals of the show. What do you actually want to teach uh, children in this new, you know, post-Soviet society? And it was in the context of that where we were developing uh, initially ideas for, uh, you know, what was what what were the Muppets going to look like? Uh, what was the show going to look like? But there were a number of ways in which um, that we were surprised by um, by the initial scripts. You know, for instance, so you know some of the early scripts were very abstract and and the writers, the initial um, uh, head writer only wanted to have uh, former representatives of the Soviet Union of writers. So the because that was a you know professional organization and she wasn't keen to have you know younger people submitting spec scripts. That's a very you know normal thing in in, in America. You would open it up you know, to people to, uh, you know, to get a fresh, uh, fresh um, perspective. But that wasn't the case in Russia initially. And so, um, you know, we ended up getting scripts that were like 10 pages long for a short comedy bit. And, you know, one example is a, a storyboard where they wanted to teach the letter D for depression. <laughs> so... <laughs> You know, that was not that took a while. But but I have to say, in the creation of the Muppets, when we first showed the uh video of, of the Sesame Street clips, our creative team did not like the Muppets. They thought they didn't look Russian. They they looked very strange. You know, the Muppets that Jim Henson created were hmm. uh they did not look like traditional Russian. Uh, puppets often made of wood that were marionettes with like exaggerated features. His were more like, you know, soft, very um, often made of foam or fur. And uh, our team was like, we don't want to use those. We want to use our own puppets. We have a tradition, a very long uh, puppetry tradition that dates back to the 16th century. So, you know, why would we need your American Muppets, you know? So even though we were uh, going to be adapting the show and, and developing original content as well as new Muppets in a set, the idea was I was, you know, instructed by Sesame Street, they still had to be Muppets. <laughs> you know, we weren't going to be throwing in, you know, a bunch of other puppets. But the but the idea was that these new newly created Muppets would not be exactly like the American Muppets, they would reflect their own, um, uh, you know, folklore and ideas. And eventually that happened. It took months and nearly caused World War III, you know, the fight over the Muppets. But basically what happened in the end is that, you know, once the team visited the U.S. and they saw the Muppets, as well as the role that Sesame Street played in American society in terms of, uh, you know, moving the country towards greater acceptance of uh, racial integration and all sorts of other really wonderful things that the that the team wanted for their own country, they they thought, well, we can we can maybe make these Muppets, design them, but in our own uh, uh, aesthetic with our own ideas. And that's they did that. They made the the full body puppet, you know, that replaces Big Bird in their show was based on a 600 year old uh, character out of Russian folklore called Domovoy, who is a a spirit of the hearth in the home who protects the home. And this character is usually uh, drawn as like an old man with like fiery beady eyes. And in this case, um, eventually they wrote, they made this character into a kind of like hound-like uh, blue uh, furry um, uh, character with uh, floppy ears and a giant um, schnauz, schna schnauz. <laughs> and he, and he, um, he had uh, um, pieces of fur 
and twigs sewn into his coat so that he was uh, a spirit of nature as well. And he lived inside a giant tree on the set with a little post box on the front. So, you know, the idea of this Muppet, if you see him and you can see him online, you know, it's magnificent. He's a magnificent Muppet puppet. Wow, and his name is Zeli Boba. That's amazing. Um, as you as you created these characters and were able to weave the history of Russia in with the Muppet concept and the Muppet magic, um, did it occur to you at the time that you were making history, that you were doing something that would have far-reaching effects? You know, because oftentimes we have 2020 hindsight. We look back at things and think, wow, look at we were what we were a part of. But did you feel that while you were doing it? Was um, the aware yeah. of it? Yeah, I mean, no, it's a great question. The, you know, I worked with uh, about 400 uh, artists in Moscow from all over the former Soviet Union. And I believe we all felt like that. We had a sense of at the time that and particularly because of the obstacles we were facing, you know, having our office shut down, having people who were uh, helping us and, and, and had committed to broadcasting the show being assassinated, everybody understood the stakes of what we were doing. And it sounds absurd, like when you think about it, okay, what are the stakes of making a children's comedy puppet show? But it really felt like that. And it's hard to imagine at least I felt this way maybe, you know, five years ago. It's hard to imagine the, um, you know, what we all felt in terms of the role that that uh, Ulitsa Sazam, which is the name of Sesame Street in Russian, could play in helping millions of children to, you know, thrive in a new, more open society. But I have to say, now with the war uh, having started, once again, I see the value of these, uh, you know, soft power types of uh, incredible collaborations. It, it makes it, it brings it home even more poignantly what we did at that time together as a team. And I'm in touch with many of my former colleagues, you know, on WhatsApp today, because of course, when we were making the program, uh, the internet was just starting and none of us had cell phones and our Russian colleagues barely, if ever, used a computer. So it's a very different time now. And yet, when I look back on that time, which is partially why I wanted to write this story now, is I understood what we had done together as a team was remarkable, remarkable. Uh, not only in terms of a business success, but also in terms of, uh, you know, what this program did to change the country. So I, I yeah. can imagine um, that was the first thing that I, I thought of when I when I looked at the book and I read your story and was introduced to you. I thought, wow, this is this is an uh, just an extraordinary tale that has as I, as I said, repercussions, ripple effects that are continuing to this day. I read commentaries and, and, and uh, feedback on different perspectives of how the Muppets have actually transformed the culture in, in, in ways, of course. Um, mm -hmm. Now, just from a, a business standpoint, I know they froze your account at one point. You had 200 people you were trying to pay and suddenly oh, oh not just data. once that <laughs> that happened several times you know during the course of production because you know at this time there weren't western banks in in uh you know russia and so transferring money to uh what was then the soviet union just after the country their government had collapsed the soviet government and a new one was you know organizing itself it uh -huh. was very difficult to do business and just manage uh, basic the most basic things you know of paying people i can imagine how, how did you how did you accomplish it i mean any business owner who's listening to this has been through financial challenges at least when they were starting out many to this day 
you know, how did you tackle it? When you run up against a problem, what is Natasha's methodology for addressing it, overcoming it, getting around it, uh, and, and ultimately um, succeeding? Do you have a secret uh, formula? Yes, ask for advice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, always That's depend <laughs> on on the people around you, you know, who are familiar with the country. And I had a wonderful partner in this, uh, Leonid Zagalski, who was my very longtime friend. And of course, we, you know, uh, asked uh, people all the time, you know, we how do we how do we get past this? Um, this was this wasn't a unique problem to our our business and, and operation. It was the same problem every business was having in post-Soviet society. Uh, and people were coming up with really creative ways to pay people in the country because not only was the ruble devaluing, uh, you know, daily. And so if you transferred money into a bank account, it was immediately converted into rubles. And so the value of your Western currency would be devalued. So that wasn't an option. So you had to come up with other ways. And there were so many different um, avenues that you could take. Uh, but in our case, um, you know, we wanted to partner with a, uh, a Russian business so that the, um, the payments could be done through that company. And there were a number of reasons why, which are complicated, but have to do with Russian law at the time. That makes sense. So I know you were you had all these external pressures, um, danger, violence, funds being frozen, and so forth. But you were also getting pressure from uh, internally from from the Sesame Workshop. They were concerned that if this did not go well, it would be catastrophic for their brand. Is my understanding. So how did you convince them to keep going? We have about well, two minutes until our next yeah. break. Yeah. Um, Sesame Workshop was amazing in terms of, you know, agreeing to do this in the first place. And the person who initially started uh, started us all down this road was Gary Nell, who uh, was the former uh, CEO of Nat Geo. Mm. And he became the CEO of Sesame Workshop as well. But at the time when he hired me, um, you know, this was really a, a visionary idea that he had um, come up with, with uh, a group of um, senators. And, uh, you know, it was brilliant. But as with any corporation, when you engage risk, there are people inside the, uh, the company that raise red flags and indicate, you know, if people are getting killed or you know, you have to take a level of risk that is uncomfortable for the company and may jeopardize the brand, they will speak out and say, hey, are we really doing the right thing? And is this the smartest decision? Now, I say that today with hindsight, but when I was uh, doing the show at the time and had very little corporate experience, of course, it was it was very challenging for me because I didn't know how to navigate that. And I was lucky enough that my boss, Baxter Urist, who was running the international division, was uh, pitch hitting in there for the show and uh, protected me in a lot of ways from the corporate you know, battles that were going on. So I was fighting it here, he was fighting it up here. And, uh, you know, it wasn't easy and, and it was, uh, it was very painful. It was, you know, uh, believe me, if you talk to my husband about what I was like during that time and how difficult it was living with me because of the stress I was under, uh, yeah, I very appreciative to him that he was so balanced and, uh, wonderful, you know, gave me really excellent advice about how to, you know, calm down when all this was going on. Wow. Uh, I can, I can only imagine, so you had an advocate at corporate and you had an advocate at home and you were an advocate for the show and the people. Um, we need to go to a, another break real quick, but we're visiting with Natasha Lance-Rogoff. I'm really enjoying your story, Natasha. 
Um, so many Thank layers you. to it, as I said. Uh, when we come back, let's talk a little bit about your your views on the Russian and Ukraine war. And I'd love to get your views on the on Russia as a country and the people. You you shared a little bit of it earlier, but I know you have a deep love. And uh, I, I have many friends who are Russian. They're an extraordinary people. And yet I think there are misconceptions, especially with this war going on and and misunderstandings that that need to be uh, clarified and um uh, address. So let's go to break real quick, but uh, don't go away, everyone. We'll be, we'll be right back. All clear. Great segment back in two. Thanks, Andrew. I've never been to Russia. It's on my bucket list. Well, I've I... never been to Iraq. <laughs> I've never been. Uh, you've been to Italy, but you're going back. Uh, I've, I've been fortunate. I've traveled uh, about 30 different countries to 48 states and uh, lived in New Zealand when I was a child. Wow. And many years in Utah, six years in Alaska, three oh, years. Where in Alaska? San Diego. I was in Anchorage for six years. Oh, I went for a summer job and ended up staying for six years. I loved it so much. My, um, my cousin uh, has a house there in Anchorage. It's an amazing place. The, the people are the best part. And obviously, if you're an outdoorsman in the country, it's incredible. Yeah. The um, Do you have a lot of listeners from the Army? You know, I don't know if they're military or not. It doesn't tell me. What, it says where people are, but mm -hmm. I don't know how many uh, veteran listeners we, we actually have. We do get a lot of feedback from veterans, uh, but I don't know the quantity. Um, I want to try to do something for the, for the, um, for the, uh, like military about Russia, mm -hmm. like it, because it's like a, such a different way of understanding Russia, but, you know, cause they're having to deal with everything in Ukraine now. Yeah. 20 seconds. All right. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah. I was in the army for nine years. I, I learned a lot especially doing what I did. Mm -hmm. You are listening to Finding Certainty with Patrick Lang. Have a question for Patrick or his guests? Join us on the show at 866-472-5790. That's 866-472-5790. Now, back to the show with Patrick. Welcome back, everyone. We're having a really fantastic conversation with Natasha Lance Rogoff, a best-selling author of The Muppets in Moscow. And the tagline for that book is, is very revealing, uh, Natasha's. It's the unexpected, crazy, true story of making Sesame Street in Russia. There's, there's a lot packed into that, that subtitle, <laughs> isn't there? Yes. So I think it's I think it's very true. I tried to write the truth. I mean, unexpected, crazy, true. Yeah, I, I think you nailed it uh, just from what I'm learning here. But, you know, as you look back on it, what do you feel like um, was the greatest impact that the show had? I thought about that a lot lately, you know, as, as, uh, I was, I was, uh, you know, obsessively watching what was going on in Ukraine and, uh, you know, it's just heartbreaking to see where we were 30 years ago working side by side. And I was leading a team, you know, with Russians, Ukrainians, all these people, you know, Armenians, Georgians, everybody working together to make this children's comedy show. Mm -hmm. And to see what happened and where we are today, it's devastating. You know, it's just incredibly heartbreaking. And it's heartbreaking for my former colleagues who were committed then and remained committed to, you know, creating a different future for their country and for millions of children, not only through the show, but in everything they did in their lives, you know, for the next 30 years. So speaking to them today, and, you know, I would say in the early part of the war, when they could still speak fairly openly on the phone, 
you know, it, it was, they were uh, heartbroken, just, just, just completely broken about what they were experiencing. So I, you know, I, I remember waking up at one, like really, uh, you know, kind of jolting up at like four in the morning, one morning. And this was after I had been watching the young people that were leaving uh, Russia because they didn't want to fight and they didn't support the war. So it was like more than a million people that had walked out of their own country. And I was thinking about them. And then it suddenly occurred to me, oh, they're in their late 20s and 30s. They grew up on Ulitsa Sazam. Those are our children. <laughs> you know, I was just like, oh my God. I mean, it really gave me a sense of we did make a difference. You know, I mean, I, I know we made a difference because the show went on to become a huge hit and it lasted for 10 years, well into Putin's era. And mm -hmm. uh, I meet people all over. And, and when I went back to Russia in January of 2020, that was the last time I was there to do interviews for the book. Uh, you know, I was meeting young people who I would say, oh, you know, by any chance, do you know Ulitsa Sazam, you know, Sesame Street in Russian? And they'd be like, oh, my goodness. And then they would break out into song and tell me who their favorite <laughs> Muppet was and um, and talk about how much it influenced their lives. Um, so I, I, I knew it had a, a tremendous impact. But then as I was sitting thinking about this even more, I realized that on the other side in Ukraine, the same age cohort of people also grew up on Ulysses Sazam, mm -hmm. that these people who are fighting for their freedom and in continued independence from the Kremlin are also the Ulysses Sazam generation. So, you know, it gave me a sense of the, the impact that the show had but also, you know, I am familiar with so many people who, uh, you know, would like to see a different narrative and a different reality for Russia, and especially for their children and grandchildren. I bet. But what would you like people to, to understand about the Russian people and the country itself, if you could say? Well, I think pretty much what you alluded to before is that many people in America don't understand that Russia is a police state today. And, you know, they they often expect that Russians can just go out and protest. But I'm talking to these people, you know, on WhatsApp every day, and they can't. Many of them have been forced to leave because they did speak out against the war and they had 24 hours to get out because P Putin passed laws against uh, speaking out against his special operation. Uh, you could get 15 years in prison. And if you're a young person, particularly a single mom, and you have to take care of children, you can't do that as, as strongly as you feel about uh, the war and what it's doing to uh, uh, the people of Ukraine, you still have to make sure that you're taking care of your child. And so I think it's very important for people to understand that. Um, and, um, you know, as well as there are uh, many, many, many Russians um, who uh, support what I would think of as, you know, values that are idealistic, that represent mm -hmm. uh, freedoms for their people. Um, so I think I think it's very important to to understand that. This is a a country of people. They're very passionate, very creative. And my experiences are mostly with uh, the artistic community in um, in Russia and beyond. Uh, but also, you know, the the politicians and businessmen and people who, uh, you know, have to deal with tremendous um, oppression in in trying to live their normal lives. Well, I think there's a interesting element I've seen. I'm, I have a lot of friends in Hollywood and 
And while values may be different and perspectives are different, in many respects, they're a voice of the people. They, they reflect the greater national viewpoints and perspectives. And there's obviously different narr narratives and different illustrations and, and so forth. But I think your work, working with the arts and community, you saw a, a, a broad swath of, of uh, the Russian people. I know you worked mm -hmm. with you talk about working with politicians and business and so forth but you know i i think as i i look at what russia is going through and the russian people as well as the ukrainian people are being subjected to by the leadership that they don't agree with more often than not i i think a little bit of of, of german german not or nazi germany right where germans were subjected to so many of them are forced into the military forced into this this um this war that they did not agree with and they paid the price for it for decades after and so it's sad right it's it's because no i think it's it's very sad i mean i would say in the case of germany as in the case of russia there are definitely russians who support this war as well mm -hmm. and um you know, uh, we have to take that into consideration as we are uh, exploring, you know, diplomatic avenues to try to bring this to an end um, and, you know, come up with ways that are going to be, despite Putin being a war criminal, uh, face saving, you know, so it can end in a way. And that's what diplomacy is supposed to do at its best. Well, there's never a, a perfect solution that one side wins and the other loses. There has to be a meeting of the minds and this middle ground, right? As much as you may disagree with the other side, one of the, great, one of the best books I've ever read is about critical conversations. And a lot of it is about meeting in the middle. Um, so should the, should the show return to Russia? What, what impact do you think it, it would have now? Well, it's impossible right now, of course. The show was canceled in 2010, mm -hmm. and uh, the cancellation happened at, at the same time that uh, uh, the Putin's regime was uh, increasing its crackdown on independent media, and a show which originated in America was not particularly popular uh, you know, to that regime. And eventually, uh, those executives that Putin appointed to uh, to run the Russian TV station, ORT, they canceled the show. So, you know, we would really have to be in a very different uh, environment with a very different landscape for Sesame Street to return to Russia. Uh, but of course, you know, I have hope. And, you know, all wars end. This war will end, too. And when it does, we should be ready. We should be ready to see if there's an opportunity to bring a program like Sesame Street or other types of programs that encourage, um, you know, openness and collaboration. So, so I am hopeful that this could happen in the future. Well, I'm optimistic as well. I think when when we end a conflict or a crisis, hopefully we learn some things from it and we come out of it. Uh, with 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 hurts and pain and losses, but also with some lessons learned and and some growth. Um, I think we have to have we have to have hope and faith in that. But well, I really uh, hope this this war ends soon because there are so many young people, you know, getting killed. It's it's just horrible. It's tragic. Well, Natasha, we really appreciate you being on the show. How can people? Uh, reach out to you either for the book or for in anything else that you do? How can they get a hold of you? I have a website. It's just my name, NatashaLanceRogoff.com. And the book and audiobook. the audiobook's fantastic. I did not narrate it, but it is a wonderful woman who speaks Russian as well. And so that is available on, on Amazon and other platforms, Spotify and Apple. Well, I think I'll be your first customer. I was recently <laughs> introduced to you and your story, and I most definitely look forward to reading the book. So uh, thanks for being here. We really appreciate you. And uh, oh, congratulations on what you accomplished. 
the good that came out of it, and I'm sure the good that is continuing to impact at least a great number of the Russian, Ukrainian, and, and other people in that area. So can, my hat is off to you. Thank you, Patrick. It's a wonderful show, and I really appreciate being on. My pleasure. Thanks for listening, everybody. Come on back next week. Remember, certainty is out there. You can find it. We're here to help if we can. Have a great week. All clear. Great job today, everyone. Great show. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a fantastic week. We'll see you next time. All right. Have a good weekend, bud. So, Natasha, was there anything we missed that you want to add to the end of the YouTube video? I think we, we covered a lot. Yeah, no, it was great. I enjoyed it. Thank you very much for doing that. My pleasure. People uh, refer to my show a lot of the time as a stroll down memory lane. So, <laughs> oh, it's uh, it's definitely yeah. No, no, it was it was interesting, and um, you know, haven't talked that much about the business angle, so that was kind of fun too. Yeah, mm. well, yeah, I, uh, I don't get uh, goosebumps very often with a guest, but as you were talking about um, the young people walking out of Russia. And realizing they were your kids, I got, I got, I still have them. I have goosebumps. Just um, uh, spirit of that and the, this, the meaning. I think it's, it's significant. So, yeah, uh, very nice and to meet thanks you. Thanks for Thank telling you. that. Very nice to meet you, and have a wonderful weekend. You too. Travel safe. I'll do the same. And uh, thanks again for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Take, Take care. care. Bye bye, y'all.